when I started, and the same as Jim, Jim never got any parts. They just give Jim a chord chart and say, go on, son, go for it, you know. Because what, what he could play, they couldn't write anyway. Because he was so good at inventing, inventing rock and roll licks and things that most of them didn't know how to write it anyway. And that's really the, why Jim did do, do most of the sessions, because they were very inventive, you know. Jimmy performed on countless sessions between 1963 and 1966. Among these were Van Morrison, The Rolling Stones and The Kinks as well as several sessions with Sheffield-born singer Dave Perry. The first time I came in contact with Jimmy Page was on some of my first sessions. And uh, Jimmy Page, Big Jim Sullivan, John Paul Jones uh, were on sort of, I would say, most of my early recordings over a period of two years. And uh, he, he was such an impressive guitarist at 19 that even ourselves, as pretty new to the business, we would wait until that session crew were available. You know, my manager would call and say, we've booked you in at Decca for a particular session, but we're going to delay it uh, for three weeks until that team is ready. Uh, because in the studio, it, it was pretty much like working with your road band. You know, you'd, you'd have the basis of the songs, but everyone had freedom to, uh, to try different things uh, within a particular time. Scale. I mean, the sessions then were sort of three-hour sessions, and you had to get the tracks down in that time. And I learned a lot from that uh, aspect of being a musician, you know, not to be too bigoted and, uh, you know, narrow-minded, to be able to adapt and listen to all different types of music. And uh, so he was, he was a, a terrific player and taught me to listen to other music. However, despite his success as a session musician, Page was becoming restless and began looking for ways in which to leave the studio behind him. It wasn't long before he got his chance. The Yardbirds were the guys who were playing a really tasty white version of R&B and blues. The Yardbirds had originally achieved recognition as one of Britain's leading rhythm and blues acts in the early 1960s. Their lead guitarist, Eric Clapton, left the group after the release of the single, For Your Love, and was soon replaced by Jimmy Page's friend, Jeff Beck, who led the group in a more psychedelic direction. In the summer of 1966, the group's bassist, Paul Samuel Smith, left the Yardbirds at precisely the time when Jimmy Page was becoming disillusioned with his session work. Quickly joining the group, it wasn't long before Page had become dual lead guitarist alongside his old friend, Jeff Beck. Although they did work some parts out together, it unfortunately was more like two gunslingers, kind of out, out pulling each other's guns, you know, kind of, you know, so it, it was actually an often, often a, a cacophony of crap, you know, at times. It could be brilliant, but it was that, you know, you had to be there for that moment. It wasn't consistent. And sometimes, you know, they were, it worked and sometimes it did it. The night that I saw them at the Ricky Tick didn't really work. Jimmy was kind of like overplaying him and Jeff was sinking sort of more and more into his sort of, into himself and letting, letting Jimmy take the control. Where it really worked as two guitar players um, was on a single that I'm actually extremely proud that the Yardbird's name is attached to called Happenings Ten Years Time Ago. mini rock opera in two and a half minutes where both Jimmy and uh, Jeff just totally excel and it's for me it's the best the totally the best example of those two guys when they worked together uh, Antonioni's film blow up I think he probably wanted originally the who but they didn't do it for whatever reason um, we had a bit of a reputation as being emotional on stage although we did it for real. I mean, Jeff, when he broke an amp or something, it was from frustration. It wasn't part of the entertainment, you know. Uh, and I think, I think Jimmy and Jeff worked out a, a song 
Well, it was actually a train kept a rolling, which we readapted to and called Stroll On. <laughs> combination of the kind of um, excitement and energy on stage and and this slightly sort of uh, bored indifferent super cool kind of audience that just sort of sits there apart from kind of one couple who dance um, so you know I think that's that's the feel that Antonioni wanted to communicate um, combination of sort of cool boredom sullenness and a kind of slight menace. As the band embarked upon their 1966 tour of America, tensions between Jeff Beck and the rest of the group were beginning to develop. Often playing two sets a day and sleeping on the tour bus, it didn't take long before these tensions came to a head. And it was all very gruelling. I, I just remember trying to sleep upright for about six weeks. Jeff was becoming pretty freaked out, you know, and, and worn out. And, and I guess a lot of things he wasn't too happy about as well. But uh, Jeff lost it, pretty much. And I think uh, he smashed his guitar. I wasn't actually in the dressing room when this happened, but uh, his red top or his flame top, Les Paul, you know, in an emotional state, and he just, 